CityCast Boise is sponsored by local author David Tuttle. David Tuttle, a U.S. Army veteran and Reiki master, has completed his most recent book, Soul License Tips and Tales. It's a spellbinding adventure of a man traveling his spiritual path with guidance from beings of the so-called other dimension. In Soul License Tips and Tales, Tuttle explores the metaphysical. He shares insights into understanding how to live a peaceful life. Soul License Tips and Tales is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Today on CityCast Boise, the crocuses are coming out and the robins are back, so we're ready to get serious about spring gardening. Emma's talking with master gardener Gretchen Anderson about what to get started on now and what you should probably wait on. Plus, we get the dirt on the Schaefer Butte rule. It's Monday, March 27th. I'm Frankie Barnhill in for Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Gretchen, welcome back. Oh, thanks. It's great to be back. Well, the weather's starting to warm up, and I think we're all getting excited here. But let's start with what not to do. What are some common mistakes people make when they have maybe a little more excitement than experience and want to start a garden in the spring? Well, I would say that uh, there's some over exuberance, you know, right now because we've had a long, cold winter, and all we want to do is get out, turn the turn the dirt, and plant some stuff. But it's still a little too early. Ah, <laughs> so, I hate to hear it. <laughs> although, although there are some there are some crops you can put in right now, and I know for a fact that, and I think you know that I work with DMB. I'm their chicken educator, and I also do their gardening blogs. But you can um, plant potatoes right now, you can plant onions right now, and then you can start seeds like there's nobody's like nobody's business. Like inside. People, oh, yeah. People can be starting seeds. What should people be starting right now? I think that you, you plant peppers and uh, squash plants right now inside so that you can transplant them a little bit later. Those are good ones. Beans, of course. The one other thing that they can plant right now, Emmett, are peas. Peas love the cold weather. Oh, yeah. Yeah, snap peas. And so if they want, if anyone wants to plant peas, onions, and uh, potatoes right now, sounds like a stew, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Peas, <laughs> onions, potatoes. That's perfect. And especially, you know, we're, we're right here in, in March. It's still pretty chilly. It's good soup weather still. So uh, I always say, ask yourself, what do you like to eat? And what do you not like to pay a lot for at the store, right? Um, and grow that. So it's a little early to be planting anything other than, like you said, um, onions, uh, potatoes, that sort of thing. But what about prep? What should people be doing to prepare the soil for when they're ready to plant when it's a little warmer? I'm, I'm hoping that most people would have prepped their soil and their garden beds in the fall. Because what you want to do is you want to prep them in the fall and leave them and let those microorganisms just develop in that soil undisturbed so that when you're ready to either sow seeds or put um, starts into the ground, you just dig a hole and put them in. And they benefit from those uh, micronutrients that are in the soil. So if that's not the case, then it is definitely time to clean up the garden with minimal disruption of the soil. And I would say also maybe put a dressing of a little bit of compost and some topsoil on top of their beds to get them ready. Well, what about weeds? Is there anything people can do right now to help control weeds for the whole season? Oh, sure. Yes. And I would say just pull. I, I don't like the idea of tilling any kind of garden bed. But if you have to till, then uh, there's no way around it. But if you can pull, that's the better thing to do. So, Emma, if you have your garden bed and you know that you're going to get weeds in there, you can put down a pre-emergent, which will kill the weeds. But it it stands to reason that you can't put seeds in there either. It will kill that as well. But you could put um, a start after you've got the bed looking good. You mentioned not disturbing the soil. And I think a lot of people, you know, were raised on this, you know, that you rototill, that you really like mix up. The will you explain a little more why you don't disturb the soil? In the springtime, when you've got your soil in your garden beds, and if we're talking about raised garden beds, you never really want to 
rototill a, a raised garden bed. <laughs> it tells me that you might be standing in your garden bed and really garden beds are meant to not stand in. So we always say, build your garden beds just four, four feet wide or less. So if you have, if you've cleaned up your garden in the winter time or in the fall time, it overwinters and all that time through the, the late fall and then winter and then early spring, the soil's microorganisms are just multiplying and multiplying. If you tear up your garden bed, it's going to disturb them. And there have been, there have been uh, studies done on what, what's the best plan of attack in terms of uh, preparing your garden beds. And now the common wisdom is you do it in the fall. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. So we're looking for with good soil, mm -hmm. you want it loose, right? You don't want to be standing. You don't want to be compacting it. You don't want to be mixing it up and killing the microbes. What else are we looking for with good soil here? Oh, you want dark soil that's a good uh, combination of what we call a sandy loam so that it has a little bit of sand in it, just a little, not a lot. And uh, you can pick it up and it will stay like like a dirt clod in your hand, right? Um, and the, the darker, the better, I think. And that's why uh, the composting programs around town, are, I think, are fa fantastic. If you're doing one of them through the city, one of your cities is doing it, then take advantage of it or make sure that you're composting at home. Yeah, the, that program is great. We've a couple of times gone and gotten a, like a truckload of compost and put it on everything, the trees, the garden beds. It's such a great program. What are some other plants and crops that like really love Boise's hot, dry summer climate and do really well here? That's a great question. I, you know, I honestly believe that most anybody can grow a tomato. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So tomatoes and peppers. Peppers love, 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 love our hot temperatures. They thrive on it. But you, you really must make certain that they get a good drink of water in the morning when we get up into those uh, triple digits. So as a master gardener, I'm so curious to know, you know, tomatoes, people can have pretty big debates. Do you cage yours? Do you hang them upside down? Do you trellis them? People do all sorts of stuff with those. Mm -hmm. You're right. And I would never hang them upside down. I tried it one year. It was a disaster. So <laughs> yeah, I cage mine. And uh, you need to cage the ones that are indeterminate. Um, there, Emma, there are two types of tomatoes. There's a determinate type of tomato and an indeterminate. And by their names, you can figure out what I'm talking about. Determinate, they grow to a certain height and that's it. They, don't, they stop growing, they fruit, and then you harvest that and you're done with that plant. Indeterminate will keep growing and flowering and fruiting and they can get to be about 20 feet high if you're caging them that high. It's possible because tomatoes are vines, so they just keep on going. So tomatoes, uh, definitely, I like a good cage for a tomato. Okay, good to know. But any any type of food, um, spinach, right now, in about a few weeks, you can plant spinach and, and lettuce very easily, and uh, it will come up in early spring. Spinach and lettuce, those types of plants, including the peas, they don't like the hot temperatures, so you have to grow them early. Okay. Good to know. Well, what about pests? The squash bugs were so crazy last year. It was the first year I didn't get a single zucchini and I would go every morning and pick off squash bugs. And I, I was, I've never seen anything like it. So what do you have like early spring tips for, for pests? First of all, I would suggest that if you grew zucchini last year, find a different place to grow your squash this year. Like where I grew my uh, butternut squash, Last year, I will not grow squash there because you can have the bug overwintering in the foliage down below. Oh. So you, they'll come back with a vengeance if you grow the same thing there. Same with tomatoes. That's why we always recommend that you rotate in a three-year basis. So one year you have your tomatoes, you know, in in the side in the north side yard, and then the backyard, and then the the south side yard, and then you just keep moving them because you don't want to encourage those pests to come back. And I'll tell you, squash bugs are the bane of many gardeners' <laughs> existence. <laughs> that, that makes me feel better. Last year, yeah. I was like, what is happening? Yeah. You, and you were doing the right thing. Really, manual <laughs> extermination is what we call it, is probably the best way to get rid of squash bugs. Is it worth buying ladybugs? 
I I just got to know because you, you see them like at, at DMB or Zamzo's, uh, mm-hmm. like the ladybugs that you can buy right there and then release. Is it worth it for, for aphids and other pests or do they just fly away? Aphids, yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you have aphids on your roses or aphids, like I, I get them on my plum tree. It's actually an Italian prune tree. And um, I think it, it helps. It doesn't cut it all down, but it helps. So the aphids, one thing with the aphids is they don't fly. So you can just take a hose and man, <laughs> spray that plant like you would, you know, within an inch <laughs> of its life and you'll get rid of a lot of them. Okay. Uh, but then they'll, but then they'll be on the ground. So you have to take care of them down there. Maybe diatomaceous earth might work for that. If you're not familiar with it, diatomaceous earth is a powdery, a white powdery substance that you can sprinkle on bugs and it'll take care of them. So aphids and uh, squash bugs are probably the bad ones, but really 95% of the bugs, Emma, in your garden are beneficials. There's another reason not to be spraying and, you know, using a lot of chemicals out there because yeah. you're killing a lot of good bugs too. Exactly. And and the fact that you were manually taking care of the squash bugs last year, that's a good thing. I wrote a blog about removing squash bug eggs. And what you do is you take the the back of the leaf, you know how on squash leaves we find the eggs there and get some... Uh, duct tape and you just press the duct tape into the eggs and it pulls them off of them and then oh smart yeah get rid of that duct tape in a good way (laughs) and yeah and you'll get rid of some of the eggs which is really nice because then you won't have to fight those little squash bugs later do you have a trick for slugs we had so many slugs last year too is there a fun home trick for that you know, I've heard of beer and I've heard, I've heard you, you set out a thing of beer and then they get, they drown themselves. They go into the beer. They like the yeast in the beer. Um, I've also, when I was a kid, we had bad slugs and we used to put salt on them. Oh. <laughs> so Gretchen, you monster. I'm sorry. I don't, you know, I've never had to deal with slugs uh, as an adult, Emma. So I don't know if I can help you that much. <laughs> we, we tried the beer thing, but my dog kept drinking it. And I was like, okay, we're, this is a real problem, actually. <laughs> what about water? Are you, do you have any tips on conserving water? I mean, we're probably looking better for this year, but last year was so dry and everybody was like underwatering and trying to conserve. Right, right. There are two things that we say about watering. One, when you have starts and when you have a fresh garden, you really have to stay on top of the watering to help their root system establish. Um, So that is, you know, looking at your plants, making certain they get water in the morning. Love a, a good drip system. And then look at them in the evening to make sure that they're faring well. If you're talking about turf, you know, grass, when I studied to be a master gardener, I thought, oh, why does anybody even have grass? It's kind of a waste. Why don't we just, you know, make, make the whole yard an edible garden? Well, turf does serve a purpose in that, in that it keeps the temperatures lower around our house, which is really nice. And um, what we always say about turf, because it's the greatest user of uh, water, our water resources, is that you want to water deep and infrequently. Uh, That means like maybe every other day or every third day and water, water it, go through a cycle and then wait for a bit and go through another cycle. Deepen and frequent because what you want to do, Emma, is you want to encourage those, those roots to get deep, your grass roots. You'll have healthier grass and they will require less water. What about people with small spaces, like maybe no yard, but they have a balcony or a patio. They live in an apartment. Can you still garden if you're in a small spot? Oh, you know it. Yes. And make your little patio a beautiful garden oasis. Um, I w- what I would do is I would grow a um, salsa garden on a patio. Oh, that's a great idea. I would get probably a San Marzano, which is a, a, a grape tomato that has won the tomato taste off out at the Canyon County Master <laughs> Garden tomato taste off okay. for years. <laughs> And no higher praise. Yeah, yeah. And so you get a San Marzano. You could also easily grow jalapenos, easily. And you can right now in a container um, do some onion sets. And so you have a good start to your salsa garden. Plus, you could you definitely could grow some cilantro. Oh, yeah, definitely. I actually grew, I had a little apartment garden and you know what did really well in containers was kale. Yes. I had a big thing of kale and I would just every, I would make smoothies and cut it 
you know, once a week and it would just pop right back up and you could, I mean, it got too hot for it eventually, but kale does really weirdly well on a balcony. Look at you. Yeah. I know, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, just one last thing I want to ask you, I just heard about this, uh, but apparently this is a very like, common Boise gardening rule. Have you heard this about not planting your tomatoes in the ground until the snow on Schaefer Butte is gone? I'm so glad you asked that because <laughs> <laughs> I just taught a, a class for community ed and we and it was called late, very late winter planning for your summer harvest. And we talked about that because I had a photo of winter 2016, 2017, right? Mm-hmm. When it was when everybody refers to it as the snowmageddon. Oh yeah. And had we waited that year, we wouldn't have planted our our, uh, tomatoes until probably July. So good question, Emma. The last frost date for our our area is May 10th. So you are absolutely golden May 10th and beyond to plant your tomatoes. Now, if you use what a, a little thing called a wall o water, you could probably plant six weeks earlier than that. Okay, good to know. Gretchen, if people want to take your class, uh, they can find it on, they can find it through Community Ed and sign up. Are you doing any more for the rest of the year? Yes, yes, I will be um, doing some harvesting classes. One of them is called Tomatoes, Six Easy Ways to Preservation. So, oh, fun. Yeah, yeah. How did, how, did, if you're going to plant a bunch of tomatoes, what are you going to do with them? You know, <laughs> um, and, uh, figuring out uh, the easiest way from point A to point B. You don't like my method. What I like to do is uh, pick a bunch of green ones, put them in a box. Pro tip, you can put those in the basement, forget about them entirely, and then later come down and have a whole bunch of rotten tomatoes. That's my preservation (laughs) tactic. (laughs) Well, Gretchen, thank you so much for being here. It's always a delight to see you. And I can't wait to see what people do with their gardens this spring. Oh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Emma. One more thing before we sign off, Idaho Power tops the list of companies releasing the most greenhouse gases in the state. That's according to a breakdown from the Idaho Capital Sun. Also among the top polluters, the Amalgamated Sugar Company in Nampa and Clearwater Papers Pulp Mill in Lewiston. Ada County releases a lot of carbon dioxide, but not as much as Canyon County. Idaho Powers set a goal for 100% clean energy by 2045, but coal and natural gas still plays a big role in their energy portfolio. Okay, that's all for today here on CityCast Boise. If you're looking for more ideas for how to get your garden growing this spring, subscribe to our Hey Boise newsletter. We have a guide to the best local spots to buy your plants. Emma will be back tomorrow morning with more local stories from around the city. See you then.